All right, here we go. Dwen Curry, welcome to Vlad TV. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, you were featured in Trap Queens uh, recently, which, you know, told a lot about your story, but we want to dig a little bit deeper in this interview. <laughs> Like I always do. You so messy. Come on. <laughs> well, your first time here. I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Yes. Okay. And this was around the time of the riots where you actually were born. Right. I'm a riot baby. You're a riot baby. Absolutely. Okay. And oldest of four kids. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So what was Detroit like in the 70s and 80s? For me, growing up, you know, it was pretty much middle class then. You know, you couldn't tell now if you go back because of, you know, it just looks like it's a war zone. But at that particular time, the community that I grew up in, you know, my grandparents, they came from the South. You know, they worked really hard, General Motors, Hudson's. And, you know, so it was a good community. So it, for me, it was good, except for some of the kids, you know. <laughs> but I handled that, so. Well, according to your mom, you were kind of different early on when most little boys were playing with, you know, basketballs and footballs and such like that. You were playing with dolls. Yeah, I don't like to get dirty. Mm. You know, that was my whole thing, you know. And then every time I play football or something like that, with the boys, then everybody wants to tackle me. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it was just, it was real weird. I didn't like it. Um, sports has never been my thing. I've always been, you know, more um, fluid. <laughs> okay. And there was a situation when you were eight years old where some kids started messing with you. Yes. Tell me about that. Okay. So... There's this bully on the block, and, you know, he always just tormented, not just me, but, you know, the others as well. And so mine was a little bit more intense because of me being different from everyone else. So he had to something, I forget what it was, he did something really, really bad. So I I ran. I was running home, and I went and told my mother. And, you know, shit, the next thing I knew, I knocked his ass upside his head because my mother said, no, uh-uh, fuck this. We are not going to play no games, period. All you got to do is get that motherfucker the one with the biggest mouth. And that's what I did. And I clobbered him and... It did. It pretty much stopped the bullying. You hit him with a skate, right? Upside his head. Because we used to go to Northland Skating Rink. <laughs> so my skates were always close to the door. So, yeah. Okay. So so that situation happened. And there was a situation at your house where your mom actually caught you messing around with the boy. I was so mad about that. I don't know if I was mad that. She caught me with the boy, or if, <laughs> or if I had been really, he was like the captain of like whatever team. And I had been trying to like, you know, he and I, we have been corresponding. So finally, he come over one day. She's supposed to be upstairs asleep for real. Like she he was. <laughs> Yeah, she was, um, that was, it was pretty bad. It was, um, it was a little bit, it's a lot deeper than what she caught, than what they show. Mm. Okay, was that your first experience with a boy, or were you messing around with boys before then? Yeah, before then. Okay, how old were you when you first started, you know, experimenting? Probably, I'll say around 13. Yes. And were you always attracted to boys or did you kind of try both sides? Always. Not, you know what? I did it with this one girl. It was so crazy. Right, Vlad? And um, she had been bugging me, bugging me, bugging me. She basically, well, I'm not going to say she raped me because that's like real extreme. 
But she was just really, really aggressive. And um, I just remember her. She just was, she got Miss Pearly where she needed to be, because, you know, I call her Miss Pearly. So she got Miss Pearly where she needed to be, standing still. And then when we went in, you know, when I went in and everything, and I don't even think we were doing it for that long, but when I came out, because she was just like, okay, 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 enough. It was all this white stuff all over me. And I was like, what the fuck is, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> what in the ghetto gala? <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. But, you know, of course I know better. You know, and it was her and probably um, a couple of other girls. Yeah. Was that your first sexual experience or was it the boy in the beginning? It was the boy. Okay. And then you tried the girl and then yeah. went right back to the boy. Mm -hmm. Now, was there any sort of sexual abuse or anything else like that early on? No. Okay. You know, actually, my mom, she was raised, you know, she's actually the second oldest. And so she had four other brothers. And actually, they were very, very territorial over me. You know, um, my one, Uncle Booby, you know, who's the oldest, then, you know, my mom, and then Uncle Leon, which is the one that I speak of on the show, you know, that just pretty much guided me. And then Uncle Reggie, and then there's Uncle Ralph. But they always rallied around me and made sure that I was good. Okay. So you're growing up in Detroit, and then right around the mid-'80s, crack actually hit. Yes. And you actually started to experiment with that early on. Absolutely. Okay. And did you know what crack was back then, or was it still so new that no one really knew the effects of it? No, I um, I did not know, you know, because it goes to that saying, when you know better, you do better. And I didn't anticipate that it would take me into a whirlwind of destruction the way that it did. And it happened expediently. It happened very expediently. And, you know, when your kids, you just thinking, oh, okay, well, we just kicking it and we partying and we could try this. And a girlfriend of mine, she had went to New York and she had came back and she said, it's um, this new drug that they got and you put it in the weed or you put it in a cigarette and you smoke it. And, you know, all of us would say, which is so ignorant to me when I think about it now, well, we're not going to put it in no pipe because we're not going to be no crackheads. <laughs> and it's like you still have the same you know, it, it still has the same effect, mm -hmm. you know, because of the drug. And um, that was my, when I got that, that was, only thing I could do was say, God, if you remove this from me, I promise I will respect it and I will not fuck with it no more. Right, because within two years, you were fully addicted. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. It was quick. It was bad. Right. You said you would steal anything that wasn't nailed down. If it wasn't nailed down, it's got to go. Now, <laughs> were you just using it or were you selling as well? No, I wasn't selling. That's one thing about it. The girls um, that I grew up with, you know, it's a gang of girls. Well, not a gang like that. You know, very prissy you know, real cute girls. And they always had um, street guys. You know, the guys that they dealt with were from the streets. And so, therefore, they would, you know, bring me with them. And they made it clear, which would be their boyfriends, that I was never, ever to touch it and made me aware that that is not my lane. 
Okay, so this is happening, and you're you're becoming more and more addicted, and you're trying to get money. And then by 1989, you were 21 at the time, you actually stole your mom's food stamps. Yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was the final step. Right. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't just that. Because the food stamps, definitely, I do not um, deny. But see, the crazy part about it, right? She didn't even get food stamps. She had bought the food stamps from somebody else. So it ain't like, you know, <laughs> but it's still wrong. You know what I'm saying? It's not, you know, it's, I'm not, there's no rationalization or justification when it comes down to my actions. But the reason why I stared off for a minute, because I believe that it was something else. You know, but I just can't remember, you know, but it was it was definitely that. OK. And by that year, she kicked you out of the house and sent you to Oakland yes. to go stay with your uncle. Mm -hmm. OK. And he was actually a former addict himself. Yes. And he was a drug counselor. Absolutely. By that point. And uh, did he get you into rehab right away or did that come later? Yeah, he did. He and you know he actually um, when my mother sent me, you know, I had like I don't know maybe a garbage bag full of clothes or something like that, whatever. Um, arrived in Oakland like four days later, and only thing that I just kept thinking was, oh, bitch, you is not gonna be living like this if you're getting ready to be riding on the Greyhound bus. But anyway, I ended up getting there and. Um, he just, he embraced me. You know, he embraced me and he made me aware that, you know, he drove me through the hood. And he said, you see this right here, right? I said, yeah. He said, if you drink something, if you smoke something, if you do anything other than a cigarette, I'm going to drop your ass off right here and put all your shit in a shopping cart and you're going to be on your own. And you're going to have to figure it out. And, you know, me, I was so green then. I said, shit, I couldn't imagine me pushing my fashions down no damn um, San Pablo. <laughs> San Pablo. <laughs> yeah, I actually grew up in Oakland myself, in the Bay Area, including yeah. Oakland. So, yeah, I know San Pablo very well. You know well. San Pablo right over yep. there about it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now, when you were living back home in Detroit, you and your mom never talked about your sexuality. No, we didn't. Right. But when you got to Oakland, your uncle asked you flat out if you were gay. Yeah, that was something else. Yeah, that was real deep. Was that the first time a family member just came out and asked you? Well, yeah, it was different. Um, you know, it was real different. He was really... Um, a different individual from when he had left Detroit and he had came to Oakland and, you know, ended up being, a, um, you know, a, a counselor. And all he knew was to just really be open and honest. But I've always known him as a jokester. So when he asked me, I was like, oh, no, this motherfucker is playing. Like, this is really going to be a problem. And all I could keep thinking about was San Pablo. You know, I'm not getting ready to be, I'm like, it's just, you know. He's like, you got to be honest with yourself. He said, that's the first step in recovery. You know, because if you don't be honest with yourself about who you are, then, you know what I'm saying? It, you'll go crazy. And one thing that he taught me, and I stand by this today, which is, it's none of my business what you think about me. It's all of my business of what I think of myself. So I don't really care because it holds no weight and no value on my life. So was it after that that you like came out as gay in terms of just like, you know, this is who I am publicly. I'm not trying to hide it and so forth. Absolutely. You know, I was a able to be able to um, 
evolve into myself. And he told, he told me early on, he said, it's layers to you. And he said, as you get older, then you'll see. And as I get older, they just keep peeling and peeling and peeling. And it's a beautiful thing because also the only thing that does not change is change itself. Right. And back then, you know, you were gay, but you were still presenting yourself as a man. Right. A gay boy. A butch queen. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. So here you are in Oakland. You come out and you end up getting a job at a hotel. Yes. Okay. And with that job, you started to kind of get into some illegal activities. Right. And, okay, so let me clear up a lot from when they see trap queens. What happened was I did work at a hotel. And at that particular time, I was um, had access to being able to get the numbers. I was supposed to go out of town. I think it was Labor Day weekend or something like that. And I had bought a ticket from a guy that was doing the tickets. But when I went to the airport, my ticket blew up. Because he had been using, like, this one card or however many cards he used, he exhausted everything. So when I called him and I said, my ticket, it blew up. Like, what's going on? So he said, I need some numbers, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I go to the job. I get the numbers. I don't even go to Labor Day weekend. Because when I found out, once he told me what to do and how to do it, then I made a bag. Right. So you would take stolen credit card numbers yes. and book airline tickets. Well, that's what he was doing for you. Yes. And you gave him more numbers. Yeah. I remember I had a guy like this that was booking tickets for me back in the day when I was real broke. And I showed up at the airport and, you know, the ticket didn't blew, work. Yeah. But usually the person who shows up at the airport doesn't get charged. No. Yeah. No, no, no. Not at all. And I they mean, just usually, you just have to rebuy the ticket, basically. I mean, basically, that's exactly what you would have to do. It's just redo the ticket, or back then they could call me and i turn around and whoop, and it's done. You know, it would be just, it would be the finality of it. It would be done. Okay, so when did it go from taking a few credit card numbers and handing them over to actually starting your own credit card scam operation? Um, For me, it was just something that actually organically happened. So none of it was planned in reference to, you know, okay, well, I think I want to do this and I want to do that. You know, I just kind of like it organically came into play and that's how it happened. And then just being affiliated with so many different people because for the most part, it's like I got my gay gangsters, but I really run with street niggas, like for real, And they respect me, and I respect them. So when you have that many individuals, different personalities in your life, then, you know, each one to each one. And that's what we did. I taught a lot of them. You ain't got to go and run 10 keys. This is what you could do. Ain't it good to get 300 real quick instead of driving across state? <laughs> right. Well, it started off with the airline tickets, but it kind of expanded to other things. Cars, TV, cell phones, computers. Well, it rooms. was more so it was the wire fraud. Mm-hmm. You know, none of my cars have been not without my name. You know, every car, every house that I have owned has always been in my name. So I want to be clear that there's no fraud or deception in any of that. You know, because if you take from it, you got to give back. You know, you just can't keep taking, taking, taking. Yeah, you got to give back. Right. And at one point, you're making about 50000 a month? Yeah, or something like that, a little bit more, maybe. I don't, you know what? I never really like to add to shit because now it make me mad. (laughs) No, it was a lot. 
you know, you figure um, when you look at it, if at that time, if I did something for maybe 300000 or something like that, then maybe equate it into like the 50 a month. But, you know, it's so much other shit that was going on. So I never really, you know, I never really, um, it was just irrelevant for me as long as I could take care of my family. Well, speaking of your family, I guess your first big purchase was you bought yourself and your mom a $60,000 mink coat. Right. So hers was 60. Both were, um, or both are, female pelts, you know, because they're still present to this day. And I always felt like, you know, the guys that my mom dealt with, you know, they were street dudes and stuff like that. And when I would watch my mother go out, now, she was not no bum by far, but all her girlfriends had on mink coats. And she would borrow my grandmother's cement coat. So it was one credit card. Right, for a $120,000 charge. Yeah. Right, and uh, when he arrived at her house, she freaked out. She was, look, <laughs> she was elated. She, yeah. wore that, she wore that thing to the market. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I guess she still has that mean coat. Of course. Yep. I just left the call storage. She's there. Mm. Nice and chill. Okay. And then by 1992, you actually moved your whole family from Detroit to Oakland. Yes. I mean, was that worrying you a little bit? I mean, you're helping to support your family, but you know the money is coming from fraudulent means. Mm, or, did not, not, or did it not matter? Really, right? not so much. I'm going to say it had to have been like maybe closer to 93 that I moved them out. When I moved them out, you know, it, it was just, it was time. And I was already doing enough. And I was working. So it's not like I wasn't working and still hustling. So I still had that going on. But, you know, once it got bigger than the job, then I had to, let the job go. <laughs> so, but no, it was good. Now, was that around the time that you transitioned to a woman? No. And so let me be clear with this, because for the most part, people get really misconstrued, you know, by pronouns and everyone is, you know, just wanting to be so safe and Sometimes when they're trying to be so safe, they end up being offensive. For me, it's, I am transgender, and the reason why I am transgender is because of the hormone regimen. You know, it makes you softer. You know, it gives me a little bubble here, and I like that, and that's my whole thing, and that's where I am. Am I walking around in a maxi dress and some stilettos? Like a lot of my other sisters are doing. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm clear on who I am. It's more androgynous. Mm -hmm. You know, the illusion of it all. You know, you have to get into the illusion. Right. And do you ever have a desire to, to be a post-op or anything else like that? Or are you happy with how you are? No, I never want her to go away. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, what's really... You know, when you look at, you know, uh, men who, who have the operation and so forth, what's usually the, the difference between you and someone like that? Well, I mean, I have girlfriends that um, that are, um, they're full where they've gotten a surgery mm -hmm. and everything is good. And they are just like woman and very adamant about you respecting them and I get it because it's a respect factor and you know I know a couple of girls where they've actually disowned their family because the family refused to sit up there and call her her mm -hmm. you know so 
I don't have any, you know, I don't have an issue with that. Like, for instance, with my mother and my sister and my brother, they still say he. They've been knowing I'm 55. I just turned 55 on Friday. They've been knowing he all their life. So now I'm getting ready to try to reform their mental on saying she because my pride is in the way because I want you to say she. Now you and you and you have to say she because you don't know me. And what you see is what you get. You see she. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And I mean, your girlfriends who did get the operation, did any of them regret it afterwards or are they very happy with it? Yeah, because one of my girlfriends hurt. It closed up. Right, because isn't it like when you get a vagina, isn't it somewhat of a like an open wound in, in a way and you have to sort of... It's real bad. I don't. I mean, at one point in time, they used to take the, um, the shaft of the penis and, you know, push it. I mean, it, incision it goes in or whatever. They're probably going to clown the shit out of me if... <laughs> If I get this wrong, I'm sorry, sisters, if I do. But I'm too old of a cat to be called a kitten. And basically, however, whatever length you are, if you seven inches, that's all you could take. And then they take the scrotum and then they make the lips and things of that nature. So they do it. I had a, um, or not had, but I do. I have a um, a daughter, you know, not by you know not biologically but she transitioned and when she went to thailand and got her surgery then you know we basically had a pussy party so <laughs> we could see <laughs> uh, okay right and i remember i had a conversation uh with a transgender uh woman and what she said was very interesting she said that she's not interested in gay men She's right. only interested in straight men because she considers herself a woman. Right. So why would she get with a gay man? She right. wants to get with a straight man, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not sure if she was post-op or pre-op or and so forth. Uh, do you sort of understand that, that you know, <laughs> mind state? And, and what is your mind state when it comes to that? Because you're, you know, you're transgender, but you're more androgynous. Right. Most um, men that I deal with like the vast majority consider themselves straight okay. or are straight men. You know, I allow them to pick their own pronoun. Me, I don't care if, you know, whatever you say, but I get what she's saying, mm -hmm. you know, because she's a lot of, um, she's very familiarized with, like within our community yeah. and what goes on. So, yeah. Okay, well, by 1993, you've been doing the credit card fraud and so forth, and then you got a, a letter from the IRS saying you owe 25000 in taxes, <laughs> which is, you know, we get IRS letters all the time. It's not really a big deal. I've been audited. Not really a big deal, but you freaked out. You thought it was like the feds are at your door and so forth. It was crazy because, you know, at the time I was a waiter, you know, but I had start hustling, like doing the airline tickets. So I was making a lot of money and I would just take it and do, 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 do. And I put it in the bank, but I didn't know, like, especially at the branch that I was at, at that particular time, it was private and all of that, but they came in and they snatched the majority or they snatched like a great deal of it out. And I got real scared. Because they said the IRS. So I'm thinking this is getting ready to be tax evasion, something to that nature. I didn't know. I got real nervous. And, you know, that's when I proceeded to move forward and take the other majority, the other majority of the money and go into business with my friend Matthew and um, get just an illusion. Right. The hair salon. Right. On Lakeshore Avenue. Right. Yeah, we were talking. I yeah. actually lived around the corner from there. By the yeah, Grand Lake Theater. Yeah, Lakeshore. Yeah, very nice area, by the way. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the nicest commercial areas in, in Oakland. Yeah, right by the Necklace of Lights. Yep. 
Yep. You know? Yeah, I know exactly where that is. Just an Illusion is a very interesting name also. Right. <laughs> that was a play off of some other things as well. Yeah. And uh, uh, this uh, a hair salon started to really be popping. Yes. A uh, bunch of celebrities would roll through. Tupac would roll through. Right. My girlfriend, um, Layla, she used to manage Pac. Okay. So, oh, Layla. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I know so that is. Layla, that's like my baby. Right. You know, so she would bring him and Mac Ma and just, you know, and they would come and get their haircuts and stuff because I had barbers as well. I think I had like maybe... um Like eight stations, all four, and two barbers, a, a massage therapist, and a masseur. And mommy was the nail tech there. And, you know, it was two other ones where they alternate. Yeah, so they would all come over. Police. Too short would come by. Yes, all the children. Yep. They would come. Everybody came. All the pimps. <laughs> Kenny Red and all of them. Okay. Rest in peace. Uh, any Tupac stories from that era? Um, not so much. Just came through. I mean, chill. I just um I just remember. Well, you know what? I do have one. Before I start generating money, there was I lived down the street. And my girlfriend at the time, Annalisa, like she was my good girlfriend, she worked at the hotel with me. And her dude was really cool with the whole digital underground. So I got a chance to meet Money B and everything, which Money B is my boy all day, every day. Yeah, I know Money B. Yeah, Money, that's, yeah, he 100, for real. And Pac and all of them would be down there. So that's a, probably about um, one of my greatest Tupac stories, the only Tupac stories. Okay, so you have this hair salon, but you're still hustling. Yes. And you have a crew called the Gay Gangsters. Yeah, GG's. And they're all gay? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? How about this? The GGs that I do have as well, they street dudes, but they pretty much protected us. I'm going to say us, but, you know, really, it was me. But nothing can go wrong with us because these was real street dudes. So they GGs too. And my girls, they GGs because everybody I know is hustlers. So they GGs. Right. And once this crew came together, you guys kind of stepped it up. You started doing, you know, fraudulent house loans and, and everything else like that. You know what? That house loan shit, I don't know where they get that from. Because no. I ain't do no fraudulent house loan. Okay, but you're talking about 300000 and so forth. Do you assume that's a house thing, no? No. Okay. That's not. That was a wire fraud. Okay. Yeah, like the money will whoop. 24 hours. That didn't have nothing to do with no house loan. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> okay. Mm -mm. And uh, you were big on Maseratis. Absolutely. Yeah. That was actually my first uh, exotic car. Yeah. A red, red Maserati convertible, peanut butter interior. Mm -hmm. You felt like a million bucks driving around in that car. Yeah, I love it. It was, you know, it definitely, um, it was an eye opener. Yeah. It's funny. I interviewed uh, this rapper out of the Bay called Cookie Money. And we talked about this. He said, those are the worst cars for criminals. The Maserati. <laughs> they are like the biggest red flag for police. Because yeah. <laughs> it's not quite the Ferrari Lamborghini level that like mm -hmm. you might actually be getting legitimate money with that. It's sort of like the mm -hmm. hustler's car that, like, you know, is better than a Benz or it's a BMW. Right. So it attracts yeah. a lot of attention and it's still, you know, around 150000 Oh, it ain't no joke. Yeah. I love it. I love right. mine. Didn't you buy a bunch of them? No, I only bought that one. Okay, just one. Yeah. Okay. Well, by 1999, you are, you know, building up and you're very flashy. So you're attracting a lot of attention. Right. Um, you kind of became a target for stick-up kids. Yes. Uh, you got a bodyguard. Yes. 
when you got the bodyguard, were things already happening? Um, or was it more of a kind of a, a safety precaution? I'm trying to think. Piper used to come, Piper used to come to the salon because he used to bodyguard for like conscious daughters mm. and all of them and a few other rappers, I forget their name. And we became, we became really, really close. You know, he would just go with me like when I had to go and pick up money and stuff like that and that type of thing. And then, um, like, when I got shot, he was definitely on deck, you know, because he didn't even want me to go out that night, mm -hmm. you know, or he just kept saying, well, I'll go with you. And I said, well, no, you don't need to go or whatever. So I dipped out on Piper's ass. So he was mad. So that's why I would, you know what I'm saying? Because if I'm going to meet, like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. One of my, look, one of my thank things, the, you know, yeah, you don't want your bodyguard around. Yeah, I his ass is nosy. So, you know, I mean, I, he nosy as hell. I don't care. Bodyguard, nah. Can't take everybody around your thing things. They're they not comfortable with that. Okay, so there was this one night, and you, you kind of alluded to this already. You go to your salon to pick up some money. Yes. And you go out to your car, and things start to happen. What happened was I ended up, because I, I know it was a Friday that day. It was in August. I had been running around picking up money all day. So I forget how much I had on me. I don't know. It was, it was, a, um, it was a great amount of cash. And I had left the salon and I went home because it was about to be dark. And I went to go and get my jacket and to cut the lights on at the house. So that's when all of that happened, when I went in and then after I came out, you know, I went and put the money up, I went and grabbed my jacket, but something told me, you need to back in. Why are you pulling in? Like, you never go nose first in the driveway. And at the time, I had a remote start. So when I went to start the remote for the car, it didn't it didn't start. So when I come down the stairs and I walk around the car to get in the car, I lived across the street. Like, really, it looked like some woods. It was, of course, it was really, really nice. But if it wasn't for them leaves shuffling, you know, it, I would have never seen it coming. Right. A group of guys approached you. Were they masked up at all or, or no? This is what's crazy. And this what um, this is what I say is a form of PTSD. It's because they did not have on masks. They had their masks pulled up. Hmm. And after they had turned around and bash the window in and drew the gun down. You know, they kept trying to snatch my necklace off. I was like, let me just take it off because it was a Benzentine link. I said, let me just take it off. I took my ring and slid it off and dropped it on the floor because I had a Coke White 300 CE and convertible that my cousin Supreme had given to me for my birthday and all black interior. So when I dropped it on the ground, I mean, you know, in the interior and the keys, they pulled me out the car and we next door to me was an apartment building. So I'm looking up under the, um, you know, we up under the light. Both of them got their masks, like not even on their face. Then they realized they, don't have a mask on, they pull a mask down. But I had enough time to be able to, you know what I'm saying, get that. But that's where the PTSD come in because, shit, I was running for my life. Okay. And I guess 
they try to kidnap you at one point? Yeah, I'm talking about we just gonna have to kidnap the bitch. I said, I said no, ma'am. I'm out of here. So you start running. Yeah, I did. Well, you know, he had the gun pointed in my face. Um, they wanted more money than what I had. Um, you know, they ripped my pocket off trying to look in there. I had just bought this fucking Chanel bag. It was a Chanel bag. I had just got like not even 24 hours. I'm going to carry it out. It's got the two gold balls and everything. And they done took the backpack. I was mad about that after I, you know, made sure that I was good and everything. But he had the gun pointed. And I grabbed the barrel of the gun and flung it and took off running. And his other friend had a gun. And at the time, he was trying to aim to get me, but I kept going round and round and round, holding the barrel like we were struggling. And then when I turned around and finally flung it up out of his hand, then I start running and his friend start shooting. Pop, 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 pop. I thought I was getting shot like in my back or something, you know, but your adrenaline is so heavy when everything is happening because the only thing you're trying to do is get the safety. And I was like, oh my God, I hope I'm not shot in my back or anything like that. So I fell all the way up, all the way down, back up. And then I saw like the, you know, the bullet wound because I ended up getting shot in the right leg. Okay, so you got shot once in the leg. Yes. Did you go to the hospital right afterwards? Absolutely. The yeah. neighbors, I ran to a neighbors and they caught the ambulance and all of that and the police. And that's when Piper really kicked in. Right. So now you're in the hospital. You just got shot. Yes. Uh, how bad was the injury? It went in and out. Okay. So you got lucky. Yeah. But it was just the attempt on my life that was um, really, you know, it, it, it was really scary. You know, situations like this, the streets talk. Mm -hmm. Did you kind of know who did it? Um, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. That situation happened. And was this the first time you ever got shot? That was the first time. Okay. But then you got shot again. Yes. In New Orleans. Yes. Tell me about that. I was actually in New Orleans with a girlfriend of mine. And her brother had gotten indicted by the feds. And we were going down there to see, you know, actually what would be happening with him. So we all flew down there and because they live in New Orleans and she's from New Orleans as well. And so when we got there, you know, they ended up giving them 10 years. We thought, that he was coming home. And unfortunately, he did not come home and he had to do those 10 years. But, you know, in New Orleans and the way they are, they're very family oriented and they just rejoice. And so it was a celebratory. At that time, I was not drinking, doing anything, not really accustomed to flying in and out of town and that type of thing. What I did not realize is that when one exit away, you know, you could jump out of the hood and be right in the suburbs. And where we were, we were in the suburbs because I said, oh, okay, y'all partying. So I just saw a little motel. So I'm going to go up the road and I'll be back in the morning so that we could take our flight because we were getting ready to take a flight. So that's when I, um, I ended up leaving there. And something told me I had took off all my jewelry and everything, but I had my belt on. I had this huge, like, um, Versace buckle, huge. And I said, well, you know what? I'm a stylist. And one of my rules is I don't care if you got on jeans or what, you always wear a belt. You could be real cute or whatever, but if you don't have on no belt, then 
it's like they got too much bad shit out here. And the buckle saved my life. Because when he stuck the gun through the window, he just started shooting. Bop, bop. But luckily, it was one. And no, it was two. It The buckle, my arm was up on the steering wheel because I was getting everything together, like in my backpack. They took that Chanel backpack too. I was mad as hell. But anyway, they um he stuck the gun through the window and the bullet went in my arm and it came out and it landed in my buckle. You know, my stomach was hurting so bad, I thought it was from the nerves. And you know what I'm saying? And I was in such shock. It wasn't until I found out once I got to the hospital that, you know, the bullet, you know, the belt basically saved my life. I still got a little mark on my stomach from the buckles um, singeing me. So this is just like a random robbery attempt, pretty yeah, much? They, they just carjacked saw someone me. with a bunch of, okay, you no, have to carjack. Yeah, I got carjacked. That's what that was. Okay. So at what point after that did you decide to move to L.A.? I decided to move to L.A., um, there was a situation that occurred and it was this guy that I had started dealing with. Now, mind you, I done already got shot like two times prior to this. So I'm really paranoid. And at this particular time, um, I ended up meeting this guy while I'm driving up the street or whatever. Look real distinguished, cool, everything. We end up talking and all of this. And um, I don't let him come over for like maybe a couple of months, but you know, now we cool. So he wanna go out to dinner and everything. So I said, all right, that's fine. So I called my little sister and I said, look, I'm gonna go out to eat, but you know, I got, you know, black Keisha with me, you know? <laughs> So, you know, everything was good, but he kept saying, um, maybe we could go to my house and you could cook. And I said, nah, nigga, that is not on the schedule. Like, so, and I get in the car with him. So when I get in the car with him, you know, it's cool. He got on like Maze and all that and the Isley Brothers. I said, okay, well, you know, he ain't no clown, whatever. So we got them re calendars. We go kick it and everything. The whole time it was a setup. Hmm. A nigga from the town has sent him on me. He was like, all you got to do is just tell the bitch, you, y'all going to go to Vegas and then y'all going to go shopping. Once you tell her she going to, you going to let her go shopping while you playing poker or whatever, then she all in. Well, that was true. <laughs> <laughs> I was on my way. <laughs> no, but it was crazy, though. It's, you know, you see how niggas end up tricking you. And it was just, it was, it's a trail of shit that goes along with that whole story. Because, you know, at the end of the day, it was bad. That's what got me up out of L.A. Okay, so after that incident, you said, I just got to get up out of here. Yeah, I'm done. You know, dude was talking about, well, I ain't got no work to put in the house, and I need some work before we go and everything. And then, baby, I'm sure, like, it's good. I said, oh, you need some work? Well, what you, you know, what you need? All I need to do is just get, like, a key or what, like I said, early on. That is not my lane. They taught me early on. This is not your lane. We'll make a car. We'll go get it. We'll. It's a whole jack move. It's jackers walking up each side of the street. A nigga all blacked out. Now, where I lived at that time was Lily White. Mm. Lily White. Yeah, listen, I feel you. I I've told this story a few times on my show, uh, you know. I decided to dabble in drug dealing back in the late 90s and 
worked with a friend of mine who was also a scammer on the side, <laughs> and he ripped me off for a kilo of cocaine. You yeah. Know, put up 17000 He showed up to my house, cooked it up, said, oh, there's something wrong with this, then claimed it was fake, and mm. I never saw my money again. Yeah. You know, but he was doing, you know, like insurance scams mm. on the side and everything else like that. And I went to college with him, so I thought we were cool. But mm. yeah, the scamming, ripping off in, in Oakland is... You know, yeah, <laughs> just I part mean, of the fabric, unfortunately. Oh, no, it's like, it's real deep because I had to come out my pocket and pay my girlfriend um, due back. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because he had went with me. And when I bring the dope in, you know, so my dude, I'm thinking that we can ready to go to Vegas and all this and he see it. And he's like, well, where do that? I said, he in the car. He said, well, I want to meet him. So I'm like, Okay, cool. And I'm like, okay, like, damn, Black Keisha is upstairs in the nightstand. Maybe I should go get her, whatever. But I said, nah. I said, let me go on ahead. So I waved dude in because, you know, my girlfriend's dude was saying, nah, you ain't got to bring it to me later. I'm coming to get my bread now. So I said, okay, cool. When I tell you when he stood up out that car it was a nigga walking in the middle of the street, all blacked out. And then I looked to my left. Then here come a nigga, all blacked out. Like I told you, it was Lily White where I live. And dude is at the door with me. And when dude is at the door with me, and I'm like, who is that? He was like, I don't know. Who is that? And I said, well, close the door. Because my friend, dude, start running. Hmm. And the other dudes start chasing him. And I'm trying to close the door. And he pulling the door open. And I'm trying to close it. And at that time, I lived in a tri-level home. So I flew downstairs to my friend's room. And he was asleep. And he jumped up out of mid-sleep and pressed his feet up against the door. You know, but it was so crazy the kids was upstairs in the living room. And they was sitting there playing that damn game. Because after they finally ended up leaving, we go back upstairs. We go upstairs because we like, oh, my God, the kids, I hope they good. We go up there, and I'm like, y'all good? And they was like, yeah. Your friend and them, they just left and turned back around and was playing the game. The only thing I could do was just like, thank God. But it was crazy. Okay, so then you decide to move to L.A. Yes. So you get to L.A. You met Yo-Yo. Yes. Just I met Yo-Yo. Her. I ran into her just recently. I met Yo-Yo in Oakland. Okay. Yeah. But you guys hooked up again in L.A. Yes. I guess uh, she did a video with Gerald Levert and yes. Tupac. Yes. Okay. And you met Lisa Ray around this time also. Yes, shortly after. And you guys became very close. Yes, that's my baby. And you became a stylist. Yes. Was that a profitable business or was that just something you were doing to kind of get in the mix? No, at that time when I was styling, um, it was really, really good money. You know, I was a personal shopper, you know, for many of the greats. And, you know, so it was definitely profitable you know i would have been able to live off of that you know really literally alone i mean at that time we were doing videos if we went into double time or whatever we might come home with like fifteen thousand from the video shoot you know just especially if you got to travel and you got per diem now you know it's a bunch of bullshit <laughs> but um yeah so that's I did. I became a stylist then, and um, it was definitely profitable. Okay. Well, you said you, you're making enough to support yourself, but you weren't just supporting yourself. No. You were supporting your family. Right. So you're paying your mom's house note. You, you had a Benz. She had a Benz. Yeah. So the burn rate is high. Right. So you're continuing to do the scamming. Right. And I guess you made around $2 million in a year at one point? Yeah. You know what? It's, I never really calculated that shit, but it's definitely a great deal of money. And it's a little um, unsettling with me. Um, 
You know what I'm saying? That I was so frivolous to a certain degree, not in all, in every aspect of my spending or anything like that. I definitely did very well. I definitely made sure that people were taken care of. I did make sure that I had acidities. So, you know what I'm saying? It just was not on no bullshit. You know, like mommy and them, I moved them from Oakland to LA and then mommy rented her house out because I bought that house for her when we went, you know, once they moved to LA and everything. So she still had the house and everything, but I just felt like I wanted everybody, you know, like with me, my brother, my sister and all of that. And you were supporting all of them? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Them my babies. I mean, did you feel a little taken advantage of? I mean, these are all adults, grown people. Yeah, that's family. I mean, I raised my sister and my brother. Right. You know, so. But they're adults now. I mean, they are, but, and I still was spoiled the shit out of them. Gotcha. You know. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, and as you're getting into the whole Hollywood lifestyle, you actually started getting on some TV shows. Yes. You were on Girlfriends. Yes. You played Blackberry. Yes. On the show. Uh, you're also on Noah's Ark. Yes. Played Romeo. <laughs> you, was, you got all the tea. And you're also like a, a costume designer on that show. Yes. So you're acting and working behind the scenes. Yes. Uh, but while you're doing this, the credit card scams, the wire frauds, everything else like that, uh, I mean, authorities said that you had made up to about $6 million. Yeah, I, I think... Um... For some opinion reason, Vlad, I'm going to say, I think that number is wrong. I think it's more. <laughs> but I don't like to think about it. But <laughs> okay. I, I go with the six million. <laughs> okay. Right around six million. Yeah. Well, uh, by 2005, someone actually cooperated against you uh, with the feds. Yes. Who was this? He was a friend of one of my um, really dear friends. And, you know, one thing about it, when you sit up there in the line of business that I once was in, you know, I'm always supposed to be kept safe. You know, it's like, I'm the one who getting ready to get the bag. So I never ever went and just really grabbed money from another dude, another street dude or something like that if it was a lick that I was hitting. I send someone like Big E. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I would do because they don't need to see me because as soon as dudes see me, then they automatically, they want to take advantage. And that's what happened with the situation. My friend turned around, connected us on a three-way with a move that we was making and it was for a bag. And once he recognized my voice on the phone, which he had no business, turning around and calling me on the three-way with him anyway. And that's where shit got fucked up. Because he was like, oh, Dwayne, I don't even know who this motherfucker is. For real. Like, total bum-ass snitch. <laughs> like, for real. I would really call his name out, but I'm not going to do it. Okay. He know who he is. And he was working with the Feds. And he from Oakland. Mm. Okay. And so he was basically working with the Feds to try to bust you. No, that's not what happened. Um, I did a wire. And when I did the wire, I gave them specific instructions. Usually, whenever I did a wire, I always made sure that there was paperwork to back it up so that in the event that you need to go to the branch and take them paperwork in reference to receiving the money or them trying to free, freeze your account, then you could have that. So I always made sure that that was the case. They did not follow proper protocol. And that's where shit got fucked up because 
I'm already being nice because it's like, I don't know, what, three seventy five or something like that? I'm cutting it in thirds so y'all could all eat. $375,000, that's yeah. what you're saying. Oof. So I'm like, I'm cutting it in thirds. Mm -hmm. So the people in the middle, they could go ahead and eat and they could split their money. The people at the bank, the reason why, I mean, not at the bank, but, you know, where the account, where the money is going to, then th that money is in case your whole ass get caught up or any of that. Because you already knew the job was dirty mm -hmm. when you signed up for it. Yeah. And then when you don't listen, then shit get fucked up. They want to take their time getting the money out. I said, what in the ghetto gala is going on? Y'all need to get all of this out. And they didn't. I said, well, you know what? This is what you do. Y'all can take y'all time with y'all shit. Run my trinette all of that. I got my money. When she went in to go and get her money, there's Tilly. Tilly done got her together. And she done told on her boyfriend. After she done told on her boyfriend, he done turned around, told on my friend and me. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then by 2009, the feds actually raid your house in Calabasas. Yes. You're not home at the time. Right. But your family's at the house. Right. When you found out about the raid, what went through your head? Um, was this the first time that a bust or an arrest of any sort was happening? Have you been mm -hmm. just like evading the authorities all these years? Yeah. Um, there was a situation that happened um, with my Woodland Hills home where they came in there and everything. And, you know, nobody ended up getting arrested or any of that. Um, with this particular situation, it was just, it was a lot different. I was in Oakland. I had just did a, um, a wire. And when I did the wire, you know, I don't even think it was that much money. I think it might have been like, I don't know, it might have been 100000 75000 something like that. Anyway, the money had cleared. So I was in a Maserati and mine driving from L.A. to Oakland. So I'm actually not even knowing what's going on. I talked to my little brother while I'm on the phone, and the dude in the car kept doing like this, but he was in like one of them accurate stuff, you know, one of them little accurate cars. He said, oh, you want to race? I said, oh, okay. So, you know, I click my buttons on the Mazi. I'm hitting them. Jerking, so he take off. So I let him go, and I'm and went right by him. But next thing I know, I'm doing like 130 miles, so I get pulled over. But when I get pulled over, you know, anything over 100, especially in California, you're supposed to get locked up. Yeah, period. So when I pull over, I'm on the phone with my mother. I tell her, "Look, you know, first I was talking to my brother, then." I call mommy and I let her know I'm getting pulled over. I'm probably getting ready to go to jail. So I get pulled over in an unmarked car. And it's a black man and he get out. And when he get out, he come to the door and, you know, I got the car park. He said, why are you going so fast? Like, what's going on with you? He said, "Can let me see your license and your registration. So I give it to him or whatever. And he don't even really look at it. And he give it back. He said, you know what? He said, what you need to do, you really need to be careful. He wasn't even talking about no speed. He already knew that they was coming because that next morning is when they came. Uh -huh. Okay, so your Calabasas house gets raided. Does anyone in the house get arrested? No. Okay, because you're not there. <gasps> no, no, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> My um, ex was in there. In the hidden part of the house. Yeah. He was in there. And I always told him, I said, don't never go in here. If anything happened, like leave us alone. Because when you walked in, 
like at that time when you walked into my closet, it looked like a dressing room, you know. And everything was just very neat and pristine and all of that. It really was no need to move anything. But in back of, you know, my stuff was a trap closet. And that's where I had all of the files. But something kept telling me, bitch, you need to get this out of here. You know, because I was really starting to stress out. And I really felt like, I said, oh, this is like real bad because my stomach was hurting. So my stomach was letting me, you know what I'm saying? It was my spirituality. It was making me aware, like, bitch, it's about to go down. Right. When the feds came in, they found that Everything. Hidden, the hidden part and they found all the Yeah, when his big everything. ass was upstairs in the closet because the way the house was, that's my closet. Up under, it's like the living room and the dining room. So all of the alphabet boys is right there, up under. And there's tons of them. His big ass is up in that damn closet, and he done made a move. That's what made them zoom up there and start pulling shit out. And they found his big ass up in there. They thought it was me hiding. But, you know, shit, we was, I was in Oakland partying like a rock star with my BFF. You know, we had to hit a lick, got some, you know what I'm saying? I got the bag and all of that. And my little sister called, she said, she said, it's bad. How did you feel when you heard about the race? Stressed out, almost threw up. Yeah. Threw, I said, where are you at? She said, I'm in the bathroom. They let me use the bathroom. She said, it's bad. I said, did they find anything? She said, they got everything. When she said everything, I thought I was going to throw up. Yeah. And eventually you turned yourself in. Yes. You were indicted for a bunch of stuff. Um, credit card fraud, wire fraud, check fraud. Identity um, theft. Yeah, definitely. All that. Mm -hmm. It's a plethora of things. Okay. Did you plead out? Yeah, I, I did. I ended up taking a plea deal. But see, one thing about a plea deal is that I'm on my own case. So, you know, I wasn't a tattler. You know what I'm saying? Nobody was yeah. in my shit. So didn't snitch I didn't anybody. Yeah. yeah, no, because they were trying to give me 10 years in the state and 10 years in the feds and run it bow legged. One after another. Yeah. Yeah, 20 years. The shit was terrible. Okay. Uh, how much money did you spend on lawyers to, to get to that plea deal? None. Because for the most part, what people fail to realize is that when you go um, and you are dealing with the feds, at least for me, my experience, was that you end up, you spend all that damn money on a lawyer and all of that shit, and then... The federal government basically has, like, some of the best damn lawyers, and they don't work cohesively together with the prosecutor. You know what I'm saying? Like, they specifically are there for you. Like, the one that I had, Nina, she killed the whole game, and she only about four six, and she was a tiger. You know, it was it was deep. My guy sister Renee was, you know, she brought her in as her peer legal to work on the case. Yeah, I mean, when the feds bust you, they already have everything laid out. They, you know, pretty much. Pretty I much. mean, ninety nine percent um, conviction rates. Well, they, I mean, ninety seven percent conviction. Yeah, rates. I mean, you know, really, a lot of times, you know, motherfuckers tell on themselves. Right. Well, yeah. and and they when they hang those huge numbers over your head, most people just plead out. Because they're too scared of the yeah. Who doing numbers. like that's what I said. Like what the fuck took okay. about thirty years. So you took four years. I ended up getting seventy seven and a half months, and I ended up doing uh, four and a half years. Okay, so you accept the plea deal, and you check yourself into prison. Yes. Okay, so you start your prison term, right? And what prison did you go to first? Okay, so. Where that's where we have to go back because there's a gap 
that you're missing because I like a few years prior to that, I got caught up doing something. And so I ended up getting sentenced to like, mm, I think like 90 days or something like that. But it was, they wanted me to get like a prison number. Mm -hmm. So they sent me from LA County to Delano, from Delano to San Quentin. And then that's right there. That was the first one. Okay. This one, was it San Quentin? Yeah. Okay. So this is 2000. When, when did you actually start your San Quentin sentence? Was it 2011 or was it early? Mm -mm. No, that would have to. See, remember I told you it's like a few years before that. It was probably like 2000. Five two thousand six, okay, right. So, you are trans, mm -hmm. but they put you in a men's prison, right? Now you had already started hormone therapy by that time. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, number one. Well, no, 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 not no. Two thousand five. No, that okay. didn't happen until okay. later. That wasn't until eight. Okay. So, so later on. You start on, on, on hormone therapy, so mm -hmm. you're presenting yourself as a woman. Right. But they put you in a men's prison. Right. Did you try to fight and go into a women's prison? No. Or was that just not a, an option at that point? No. I mean, well, Because, because one... you see, for example, you hear of stories these days where trans uh, women go into women's prison. Right. And then you hear these stories how they get some of the other inmates pregnant and yeah, so forth. Yeah, that's real deep, ain't it? Yeah. I mean, come on now. That's no, I definitely was not. Because, like I said early on, I'm used to dealing with dudes from the street. So I wasn't like scared about that or anything because I know like my cousins and them and just, you know, during life experiences and just seeing how stuff is. I know I'm a person where I mind my business and, you know, I'm not getting ready to be in yours. And basically that's what it's about. Everything is about, you know, having a respect factor. Well, your first night in San Quentin, your cellmate was doing 25 years. Yeah, I think he had um, like a life sentence, but he had already been in there like 25 years. Okay. Yeah. And something happened. Right. It was. Can you it talk was, about it? Sure. Um, it was a really bad situation because, like I said, I didn't even have long to do. And at that particular facility, they had um, a camp. And then I think maybe like a level one or two. And then it's the maximum, you know, where the lifers are, you know, 10 plus and everything. Instead of them sending me to um to the camp, because remember now, Vlad, I only got like, what, like 60, 30 days left, something like that. I shouldn't be going to where the lifers are. Yeah. But what I found out is that the guards actually take the girls and traffic them to the lifers because, you know, like they say, you you bring a bitch around, then you could calm down a nigga. You know what I'm saying? So when they put me there, then that's when it just ended up being um, a really bad nightmare. Okay. You were sexually assaulted? Yeah, it was re repeatedly. You know, it was like, it's like no other. It was um, powerless. How do you be locked in a cell and it's bars, you know, and you can't get out? And if you ever look at any of the um, documentaries on television and you see where the bars are, where it's open bars and all of that. And I literally had to like bite down on the pillow or whatever it was 
not to like make no noise and scream, you know, because I don't want to come out of the cell and be embarrassed, you know, but it wasn't just me. You would hear this like throughout the night. So I don't know who sat up there and said some shit talking about, oh no, it don't happen. Um, like that no more. No, use a motherfucking lie. That's not even a story that I I don't even like to tell the story because I think of my mother and my siblings, you know, because the shit didn't come out until Trap Queens. Yeah. That's how embedded and buried it was. But, you know, I'm authentic. That's some shit I've dealt with. But then they have to learn how to deal with that shit now. Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, it's ridiculous. Sad. Yeah, I'm sorry that happened to you. No, nah, it was awful. You just like... Yeah, that shit is crazy. I mean, were you seeing... Well, I mean, you talked about it. I guess other trans prisoners were getting raped as well. It wasn't... Look, let me tell you. When I ended up uh, the next morning, you know, he went to the yard or whatever and I went out on the tier so Auntie Jazzy i never forget her she came down to where I was and she said hey baby what's your name and I said Dwayne she said Dwayne that ain't no girl name <laughs> I'm gonna call you Dee Dee so I was laughing she said you alright and I said yeah I'm good she said no you're not so she grabbed my face she lifted it up Turn me to the side, each side. She said, go get your shit. You coming with me. And I said, well, what you mean? She said, let me tell you this. Every bitch that then came out of this cell has usually left up out of here on a stretcher. With they ass busted, they jaw broke, or something like that. She said, I don't know how you did it, but get your shit. You coming with me. So she had like one of her homeboys with her, Lamb. I never forget. He was a crit. And they took me up to Jazzy Cell. I got up there. I had never felt in this so crazy to self to say more at home. You know, she was doing everything, selling hair rinds, selling weed, doing all that and running around. And the dude came back from the yard. And the other inmates had told them that Jazzy had took me and he came looking for me. Where the bitch at? What up? So they ended up paying him to leave me alone because Lamb kept telling him, man, she too short. You know, when you short, that means you ain't got no time left. You really ain't. Nigga, you got a life sentence. The bitch is short. Yeah. Like, leave her alone. So they made sure everything was good. Okay. What year did you actually get out from from that uh, that term? Remember, I I didn't even have long to do. It was within that year. Okay, do you remember what year that was? Uh, I think. Remember, I said it had to be like two thousand five, two thousand six. Yeah, something like that. It was in between in that era. Okay, you went back in. Was it two thousand eleven? Two thousand and nine. Nine. That's when I got indicted. Right. Yeah. And then how long was that other term? The four first years? stint that I did was four and a half years. Okay. And then once I got out in 2013, and then 2015 is when I went back. So you get out mm-hmm. after doing a few years, and you start to scam again. No. No? No. Oh, was it? So what did you get busted for? I was actually being good. You were being good this time. No, I was actually being good. But this is what's crazy. When I got indicted, right, Mm -hmm. there was a file cabinet that I had at my house. This is like when I got indicted. So I still, I'm coming home and all of the stuff is coming out of storage and everything. I never even go through the file cabinet because it ain't nothing but... um, old homeowners insurance and 
you know, that type of paperwork that I don't even need to be bothered with because I don't even have that type of income or any of that to be even dealing with or in, none of it. So apparently when I was hustling and I had so many profiles, I had taken some and shoved it in between my paperwork that my, you know, legal paperwork. So I guess when the feds came and when they went through everything, they saw the paperwork. Mm. But the only reason why they saw the paperwork is because the bitch told on me. Okay. So, <laughs> we, so, so let's talk about this. So you, you, were, you were roommates with Monique oh. Slaughter, who was on Love and Hip Hop. Mm -hmm. What happened with that situation? You know, this is going to end up being something else. <laughs> Already know. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. This is going to be something. Um, and Monique Slaughter also has a baby with Lil Fizz of B2K. Yeah, adorable. Yeah, absolutely adorable. Can't deny that. Um, basically, Monice and I were just not really a good fit. You know, um, she had a lot of things going on, um, and we clashed in many ways. You know, not too much, but, um, at the, at that particular time, I was not really, um, aware of, like, maybe, um, I don't want to say, well, yeah, her mental stability or whatever. She was dealing with a lot, going through a lot. I get that. Um, you know, it, like we just really, really did not. Certain things she would do, I didn't, you know, I didn't really approve of. You know, I didn't like none of that. I don't understand how, you know, you could sit up here and, you know, run around, you know, with this athlete or this major megastar and you don't have no car and you're struggling you know and um and i say what well, i know you got to be getting some money from whoa from this one and i'm being respectful because i'm not getting ready to call no names i know exactly who it is oh no i don't fuck for money i fuck for love bitch is you crazy what in the ghetto gala is going on? I don't know none of my girlfriend. I don't know bitches like that. I'm bitch. We is in the. We are not supposed to be in this house together. This is not good. So, you know, I had my opinion, and she had hers, and however it is. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it was definitely a relationship formed between my probation officer and her. Oh. And so that's where the tip-off comes from. So Monique's She daughter. had the nerve to sit up there when they came up into the house and they showed pictures of my friend, Lacey, and we were both in the halfway house together and both federal felons are not even supposed to be in contact and this girl, my friend, used to sit up there and watch her son. And soon as they pull the pictures out, and I'm sitting right there with her. I'm sitting right there. I'm watching her. And we, like, on the couch. You know, when the people come in. Because they say, that's not, no, warrant for your arrest. We just have to search the premises. Usually, the motherfuckers be coming to get you. Right? So they want to see if what she had to say is factual. They pulled the pictures out and they showed them pictures. Oh, yeah, that's Lacey. She be over all the time. Violation. Boom. So you get sent back to prison over that? Yes. For how long? Two years. Mm hmm. Have you ever talked to Monice after this? For what? For what? 
I got you. Okay, what year did you go back in? I don't even like to breathe life into that because I already know, like, if it's going to end up being some shit. So now, you know what I'm saying? Now I done revived the bitch because I already know she going to clap back. But you know what? Even after she clapped back, I have nothing for her. Yes, bitch, I did used to drink like a motherfucker. And yes, because you drove me the fuck crazy. And yes, you are a fucking snitch. And every motherfucking body should know it, that you's a snitch. But I can't blame you because you's a square bitch. And most square bitches, why would you not expect them to snitch? So I'm done with it. Okay, so then you go back in for two more years. Yes. And thank you. Because if I wouldn't have went back, I wouldn't be sitting here with Vlad. <laughs> what prison were you in this time? Um, I went to Lumpoc. Hmm. And then, no, when I went back for two years, I ended up um, going downtown to MDC. So you were in jail? Yes. Okay. No, 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 no. Oh, it was, it was prison? Yeah. Okay, got it. Because, you know, that's the federal. Oh, okay, got it. Got it. Hold in there. You know? Got it. Okay, was this experience better than the last one? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So they weren't putting you in bad situations no. and so forth? Mm -mm. Got it. So you get out what year? Mm. 2000 and what? 15? I think it's 2015. Um, I get out 2013. I go back in 2015. So 2017. That's okay. when I got out. When you get out in 2017, was there like, uh, okay, I really got to change my life around. I can't keep going back and forth and losing all these years. <laughs> I felt like that before I went, you know, <laughs> for real. So I already felt like that. You know, was I a lot more intuitive and aware and guarded in regards to how I deal with people and who... I allow into my space? Absolutely. You know, that's just, that's a part of the process. Well, you talked about the, the hardest thing you've had to deal with was the accountability. Yeah. Because, you know, there are real victims in this. This mm -hmm. is not just stealing from some nameless corporation. These are, you know, you were taking, you know, money out of people's IRAs, mm -hmm. you know, their, their retirement funds mm -hmm. um, and so forth. Was most of the money returned or, you know, was it all spent and, you know, only so much restitution could happen? Because you're talking about six million plus dollars. How so, does a regular working person come up with that? Well, first of all, my restitution is nowhere near any of that. How much was it? Million. How much it was, was like 60,000. Really? Because only one institution filed against me. And then let's be real clear. I wasn't just running out and just robbing motherfuckers for their money or anything like that. That's why people need to pay attention to their accounts, especially your 401ks, your 403bs, your IRAs, and all of that. You need to be able to look at it as opposed to looking at the shit every three months. That's how they asses got it. And then when I turn around and I took that money out, FDIC is real. They're insured. You get your money back. Up to 50000 uh, mm, I don't know. Maybe they changed it now. Let's look it up. Yeah, maybe they changed it now. 250000 Yeah, don't play with me. Sorry, 250000 <laughs> Okay, so you're saying that a lot of the money got returned by the FDIC. Clearly, because that's your insurance. That's like if somebody go in your account, Vlad. Yeah. And yet they done snatched your shit. So you just had an L? No, you, That's you, where you, you went. Filed, uh, you no, okay. Well, look, you. you be one of the victims. How you feel? Upset. Well, okay. So, and then you gonna get your shit back, right? Right. You inconvenienced for a minute, but you got your bread back. So you're saying that most of the people got their money back. All of them got their All money back. Them. That's what FDIC is for. Right. Don't play with it. And then he had the nerve to look it up in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're right. It's 250000 I know. Right. 
Right, but it's only certain types of accounts. Like you know, if you had like a uh, like a stock like a stock market account, you know, you wouldn't be able to get any of it. You know, it's only if it's an actual bank. Mm. Okay, so most of the money got returned, but you still feel bad about it. Well, yeah, to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. Not really. Not really. Because I had to make sure that they were good, and I could say not really now because well, you know what? I'm not gonna say that. I feel bad that um you know that the people were inconvenienced you know in actuality i do know for a fact that they did get their money back i'm real clear on that so you know of course none of us like to do you know i don't like to do i didn't really enjoy doing it like that what i enjoyed was making sure to make to make sure that my family ate and that they were taken care of. Well, you're 55 years old now? Yeah. You know, things are more expensive than ever these days. Inflation has gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you've gotten used to a certain type of lifestyle, Mm -hmm. but you also went to prison Mm -hmm. for multiple times, multiple years for that Mm -hmm. lifestyle. Trying to make it through life with many years left I mean, do you ever struggle with that of trying to keep the state, you know, the straight and narrow when you know you can make all this easy money, but there are serious consequences about it? No, absolutely. I don't even, um, I'm so comfortable with, you know, of course, there's always room for growth and I just keep growing as I go along, but I don't never look at, oh, okay, I got to get back to this level and I need to have this Chanel bag or anything like that. I mean, I have a plethora of them. I don't worry about none of that. Like I told my mother and sister, I said, as long as y'all make sure that I got my bags and my clothes when I get home, we'll be good. I'll be able to figure out how to get money. Like, it'll be fine. So, no, I don't, you know, none of that bothers. At first, when you first come home, it's really, really deep, you know, because you don't go to prison as a millionaire and you have to come home to an EBT card. Right. I didn't even know how to, like, I didn't even know what an EBT card was or anything. You know, so I ended up depending on that 192 a month and that two, um, that 192 for the food and 221 in cash. So, you know, it got really, really real because I never had to budget. I never looked at a grocery bill. I don't. I couldn't even tell you now what my biggest grocery bill may have been. Well, you talked about, you know, transgender rights mm-hmm. and how the level of violence towards uh, transgender people is much higher. Right. You know, both in prison and on the street. Right. Um, you know, and you know, for example, I interviewed Sydney Starr. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, she told me, you know, she's trans, uh, yes. she's trans as well. Mm-hmm. And she told me that she's gotten with guys and not told them that oh. she was trans. That's um, a dangerous game. And That's a real dangerous it is, game. It is. And, yeah. you, and you see, you know, and, you know, from my perception, sometimes that's, you know, what happens in terms of the violence sometimes is that mm-hmm. sometimes men think that they're dealing with a woman they find out you know it's trans and then they're they're dealing with their own insecurities and so forth and they lash out is that yeah, i mean like who does that i mean that's just that's not my thing right I'm, well, you, well, you've always presented yourself yeah like, I, I don't think a person am, will look at you and say you know i'm sure that this is a woman yeah, they understand good. they understand who you are and right. so and forth. then and even if they did not know then i'm still going to tell them because that's a very dangerous game do you know people that life. have had violent incidents because of this yeah i know girls that got killed yeah like tons of them like i'm serious that's not no good that is not a that's nothing safe about that nothing at all you know, I don't know, you know what I'm saying? If a person can't accept you for who they are, then that's fine. Deuces. Like, it's really not even that deep. A lot of straight guys, they be, oh, well, you know, I ain't got, I'm not even checking for you, nigga. 
Like, I'm not. Your pockets is flat. Ain't nothing really going down or nothing like that. I'm definitely not checking for you. But, but you say that a lot of the guys that you date are straight. Yeah. So does that mean that they keep this relationship with you secret? Yes. And does that bother you? Um, It did. Um, Well, no, it didn't before. You know, it was something about the secrecy and all of that and everything. But I've kind of like, you know, moved out of that era to where, you know, I got to be this huge secret and that type of thing. You know, if you can't really, you know, you can't, I'm not bringing nobody to my house anymore to meet my family unless I'm meeting yours. Mm. So, you know, I've dealt with dudes where they've turned around and we've been, um, you know, intimate and all of that and interacting. And I don't hear from them. And I'm like, where they at? And then coming to find out, they end up being dead. Mm. You know, but why I didn't know. So if we was that close or whatever, it's like, why would you put someone through that type of torture? So it's always been a boundary. Uh, like there's a, a blockage when it comes to my feelings, when it comes to men, you know, certain men that I may deal with because I know it's not forever. Yeah. You know, it's temporary. It's just, you know, it is what it is. Uh, well, Dwayne Curry, I appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Um, the thing I like most uh, about you is how comfortable you are with who you are. Yes. You know, there's, you know, you've fully accepted, you know, and embraced yeah. who you are. You don't try to hide it or sugarcoat it or, or anything no, else like you that. have to be. Yeah. You know, as well as talking about the realities of the trans community, yeah. because a lot of times, you know, when I say things like, you know, more trans people, you know, end up dying because of the deception mm -hmm. process and so forth. Oh, no, you're just being, no, that's you know, real. no, but it's a real thing. No, it is. It's, 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 a, like, it's a real then, thing because, you yeah. know, not, not every man is comfortable with their own sexuality as well. They may be gay, but they're not accepting that they're gay. No, and, and then you have to remember, especially with straight men, when they do, and, and a lot of the girls, they know, you know, you have to be really, really careful with them especially if it's their true first time. Yeah. You know, if they have not indulged, like, they will freak the fuck out. Yeah, there was the, remember the story, was it Jenny Jones? That whole incident where um, they had a TV show where it was like my secret crush. And mm. they had this guy who had a secret crush. He didn't know who it was. And during the, the prepping process, he asked, well, is it a girl or a guy? And they kind of like, oh, it's, it's a girl. And then when he was on television, they brought out a guy. That's so, me. Right. So, so now he is embarrassed on national that television. That is embarrassing. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, um, not that there's anything wrong with being gay, but he didn't even know that this was going to be yeah, a man. Yeah, but that's still not fair. Right. It's just kind of like you assassinating his character. Exactly. And you know what I'm saying? That's why... Like, all my real niggas, I make sure that they respect it. Yeah. You know, all the time. Well, what happened with that was, you know, the show happened, and then his male crush ended up, uh, I guess, sending him some more messages saying, hey, you can come get some of this and so forth. And he ended up losing Killing it. Killing him or something. Yeah, he took he? a shotgun, showed up at his house, and killed him. And they tried to kind of drag Jenny Jones into the, you know, basically yeah. saying that he was oh, set yeah, up. Yeah, I do remember that. That was years ago. That was yeah. years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because she got in trouble for that. Didn't she kind of like? Well, go she had to. She had to take the stand, yeah. and she was facing. I think. I think she ultimately walked away from it. But it's, it's one of those things where it's like, not everyone is as open and comfortable as you are with right. their sexuality. Some people, you know, are unfortunately homophobic. Some mm -hmm. people are struggling with their own homosexuality, but they're not, they're too scared to come out to their friends and family, much less being oh, I could clock them. I, I could clock them and immediately I can clock the, I know my children. Yeah. 
I could clock them. I know when you're one of me, yep. regardless of how you try to hide it. Did you feel like, for example, remember uh, Dave Chappelle was getting a lot of flack over his stand-up, talking about his trans friend who ended up killing herself? That was um, terrible. But I feel like, you know, Dave Chappelle, people need to be able to... Um, if you don't like him, just don't watch him. You know what I'm saying? The only thing he's doing is really telling the truth. Yeah. And so a lot of times people just really don't like to hear it. It's not anything like, um, I feel as though um, deflammatory in, in regards to what he be saying. I just don't really, you know what I'm saying? I don't give life to that because he really does not mean no harm. No, I mean, I, in fact, I felt when I watched it, from my point of view, I felt that that story illustrated how a person could be comfortable with themselves, but when you deal with internet bullying, it ends up being overwhelming. Yeah. And really, it was more of a focus on the bullying mm -hmm. as opposed to any sort of derogatory, mm -hmm. you know, uh, statements about this trans woman. Mm -hmm. But but bullying is real unfortunately and you know not everyone could take it yeah and you know that a very tragic tragic ending and then but it sort of transformed to something that i really didn't understand you know because people were sort of up in arms and so forth yeah you know and, and you see that a lot you know people say oh well there's only two genders and now people you know do you believe there's two genders or? i mean i just don't even really get into it i just tell the children call me Dwayne. <laughs> Or GG. There you go. <laughs> Either one, GG or Dwayne, because I am GG, the original gay gangster. There so we go. I'm good with that. Well, Dwayne, I appreciate you coming in and uh, congratulations for, you know, surviving all the ups and downs of your life. I mean, we all have our ups and downs, but yours are were very extreme between getting shot twice, uh, you know, having to go to prison multiple times, the yeah. horrors that you faced. Yeah. You know, over there, but you're still standing tall. You're still confident. Yeah. You know, wish you only the best. Well, thank you very much for having me, Vlad. You're I appreciate very welcome. It. Peace. Peace.